This is the fourth video in the video series of cell respiration where we are going to be talking about oxidative phosphorylation. So, so far we've, we've discussed glycolysis, that happens in the cytoplasm, and then we've discussed pyruvate oxidation and the citric acid cycle that happened in your matrix of the mitochondrion. And now we are moving to the inner mitochondrial membrane and we're gonna be discussing oxidative phosphorylation. So oxidative phosphorylation is broken up into two parts. We have the electron transport chain, or the ETC, and chemiosmosis. So we're going to cover each of those parts uh, separately. And the first thing that you should notice in this overview diagram is the large amount of ATP that is generated from oxidative phosphorylation. So that's going to be very important to remember is that the majority of the ATP that is generated in the process of cell respiration is generated during oxidative phosphorylation within the inner mitochondrial membrane. And you'll also notice that the only inputs that are being um, used in oxidative phosphorylation are the electrons coming from NAD in glycolysis as well as the electrons coming from NAD and or FAD from uh, the citric acid cycle, okay? So here is our um, overview diagram and the one from your textbook again. So we are, we've talked about glycolysis, we've talked about pyruvate oxidation, the citric acid cycle, and so now we are gonna be talking about oxidative phosphorylation. So as a reminder, the inputs that are going into this uh, part of the pathway are your electrons coming from NAD from glycolysis, as well as from NAD and or FAD from pyruvate oxidation and the citric acid cycle. And, and then what we're generating is ATP, okay? So all of this is happening in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay, so actually let me go back and I'll read what it said at the top. So electrons that are extracted in the series of the citric acid cycle reactions, as well as from pyruvate oxidation and glycolysis, are carried by NAD and FADH2 to the electron transport chain, which is the first part of oxidative phosphorylation. So here's some AP language for you. The electron transport chain captures free energy from electrons in a series of coupled reactions that establish an electrochemical gradient across the inner mitochondrial membrane in regards to the mitochondria. Um, and then underneath here it tells you, you know, the, this is happening in the inner mitochondrial membrane for respiration, but then also electron transport chains. The concept of it can occur in the uh, thylakoid membrane of the chloroplast, and then they can also occur in the plasma membranes for prokaryotes. So oxidative phosphorylation is our primary source of ATP. That will be very important to remember, okay? And what exactly is happening in oxidative phosphorylation? So in this process, we have within the mitochondrial membrane, we are converting one form of chemical energy to another form of energy. So in other words, the electrons um, coming from the electron shuttles of NAD and FADH2, those are used to generate ATP, okay? And our final electron acceptor is oxygen. Okay, so that's the process of oxidative phosphorylation. It's converting the high energy electrons from NAD and FAD to generate ATP in the presence of oxygen. All right, so we're gonna start with um, the free energy changes within the electron transport chain itself, okay? So, and I wrote it down in steps for you so that you can kind of follow along a little bit better on as I'm explaining the diagrams. So the process of electron transport, because remember now we're, we have these electrons and we're transporting them to the inner mitochondrial membrane, okay? So that process begins when the hydrogen ion is removed from NADH and this will generate AD, AD, NAD plus and then that hydrogen ion is converted into a proton and two electrons. Okay, so a hydrogen ion proton and two electrons. Those two electrons are then passed through a series of different electron carrier proteins within the electron transport chain. 
and that's what this is supposed to represent. These are all three different electron carrier proteins. So the electrons start with high energy and then they lose it as they get passed along the chain from protein complex to protein complex. Typically, each proton moves from one metal ion to another. So all of these protein complexes that we're referring to, they do have cofactors in them that will bind very tightly to the, to the ions. Okay, so most of the proteins involved are grouped into what we call multi-enzyme complexes, and we've talked about that before. And then each complex in the chain has a greater affinity for electrons than its predecessor or the complex that came before it. So the electrons are passed sequentially, so in order, from one complex to another until they are finally transferred to the, to the um, final electron acceptor, which is oxygen. Okay. And so here's another diagram of that. And we're going to, I know this one has the chloroplast on it, so I'm going to revisit this, this diagram in another video, but we're going to focus on the electron transport process in the mitochondrion. So in this diagram, uh, the inputs are in green, okay? Our products are in blue. And then the path of the electron flow are, is indicated by these red arrows here. Okay, and then the last thing are the protein complexes that are colored in orange. Okay, so it's just a diagram explaining what I already went over on the previous slide. But here's another one that is from your textbook. And so this one might be a little bit more familiar and it's covering the same concept that I just went over. Okay, so remember, most of the components of the electron transport chain are multi-enzyme complexes. Okay, that's what these are, complex one, complex two, three, and four, okay? Um, and all these complexes have cofactors bound to them. Now this diagram right here shows the sequence of the electron carriers in the electron transport chain and the drop in free energy as the electrons travel down the electron transport chain. So during transport, the electron carriers will alternate between a reduced and an oxidized state as they accept and donate electrons. Okay, each component of the electron transport chain is reduced as it accepts the electrons, but then it's oxidized when it passes the electrons, quote, downhill to the next protein in the chain. Okay, so if we go over what happens first here, um, First, we have the electrons from glucose in glycolysis um, that came from NAD+. Plus, and, well, let me back up. So the electrons are from NAD+, plus coming from glycolysis and the citric acid cycle, right? And so those electrons are going to be transferred from NADH to the first molecule or the first multi-protein complex within the electron transport chain and this would be complex one but specifically it's transferred to the first um, cofactor which is FM, FMN and then that will become uh, reduced as it accepts the electron and then it's oxidized as it passes the electron down to um, FES and then that one will be reduced as it accepts the electron and then becomes oxidized as it passes the electron down to Q or ubiquinone. Okay? So most of the other carrier proteins between, well, and also non proteins as well, but most of the other electron carriers between ubiquinone and then our final electron acceptor of oxygen are what we call cytochromes. And the cytochromes. Um, have a particular cofactor called a heme. Now, the cytochromes are all different. That's why they're numbered differently and labeled differently, and it depends on the um, heme cofactor, okay? So then finally, we have our electron acceptor of oxygen, which is very electronegative, and it will pick up the electrons as well as two hydrogen ions from the aqueous solution in order to form water molecules, okay? So that's NADH, but of course we also have FADH2, but if you'll notice, so FADH2 also carries two electrons per molecule, but if you notice, um, it enters the electron transport chain at complex two, 
So that means that it enters at a lower energy level than NADH. And so that's what also accounts for the difference in range of ATP that's ultimately generated, okay? All right, so the passage of electrons is accompanied by the formation of a proton gradient across the inner mitochondrial membrane or the thylakoid membrane of chloroplasts with the membranes separating a region of high proton concentration from a region of low. And then in prokaryotes, the passage of electrons is accompanied by the outward movement of protons across the plasma membrane. All right, that was a little bit of AP language for you. Okay, so here's our diagram from the textbook. I'm showing you the whole process of oxidative phosphorylation. Remember, it is divided into two parts. We have the electron transport chain, and then we have chemia osmosis, okay? So as the electrons move along the electron transport chain, energy is stored as an electrochemical proton gradient across the inner mitochondrial membrane. So what I'm gonna do now is I will show you um, a quick two minute video that will go over most of the energy harvested from organic molecules during glycolysis and the citric acid cycle is stored sorry i wanted to pause it because i wanted to i wanted to show you um an animation of the electron transport chain okay so here we go the electron transport chain is an array of molecules mostly proteins built into the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. NADH gives up its high-energy electrons to the first complex in the electron transport chain. The electrons move from one member of the chain to the next, giving up their energy as they are pulled from NADH toward highly electronegative oxygen. The energy given up by the flow of electrons is used to pump hydrogen ions from the mitochondrial matrix into the intermembrane space. Oxygen captures the electrons in the very last step in electron transport. The last complex adds a pair of electrons to an oxygen atom and two hydrogen ions, forming water. The electron transport chain has used the energy of moving electrons to pump hydrogen ions into the intermembrane space. This buildup of hydrogen ions, like water behind a dam, stores the potential energy that was originally in the bonds of glucose molecules. The backed up hydrogen ions give up their energy when they diffuse through a special protein in the membrane called ATP synthase. As hydrogen ions flow down their concentration gradient, ATP synthase captures their energy to make ATP. This mode of ATP production is called oxidative phosphorylation because it is powered by the transfer of electrons to oxygen. Under normal conditions, Almost all the ATP produced in the process of cellular respiration is manufactured by electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation. About 34 ATPs for every glucose consumed. This illustration summarizes the cellular... Okay, so we will stop there. And I'm going to go ahead and go back to our slides here. Um, so, well, here we go. Okay, so you know what, I might actually just stop it here and we'll pick up in, in a video of part two.